So welcome, um, my name is Claire, Claire Seek, and I am part of um, Repair Cafe Portsmouth on the south coast in the UK, and also part of a group um, of the Community Repair Network, which um, which we'll touch on slightly later. Um, and we want to take this opportunity as part of Ethical Consumer Week to talk to you about repair. And um, within that topic of closing the climate gap, we really think repair has a part to play in that. So we are the last session of the week. There's been lots of different things um, talked about, and we hope we give you some food for thought this evening. We're going to be joined by um, a range of people that you will see on the screen at the minute. And um, the way it's going to work is we're going to have a couple of people talking about things. Um, I'm going to interview a couple of people and then we're going to have lots of time at the end for questions. So if there's a question that pops up while we're doing presentations, please feel free to pop that in the chat so you don't forget it and equally jot it down. And it's really helpful in the chat, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, if you can um, put a cue at the start of a question, if that's different, you know, to just sort of adding a comment in or um, making something, it just will help us to sort of sift through the comments, uh, the questions at the end um, to maybe bunch some of those together. Um, everyone is muted at this point just to uh, reduce disruption, you know what it's like on Zoom with cats and children and <laughs> all manner of things that can happen, but obviously if we get to the point of questions and you want to add something in, please uh, do chip in. And um, I think that's all the housekeeping really, so we will get started and um, I'd like to introduce you to Ugo from the Restart Project, who's going to start us off um, talking about the sort of bigger picture. So Ugo, I'll hand over to you. Great, uh, thank you. And thanks for everyone who's joining us. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. Hopefully it will work. Yes, I uh, hope you can all see it and still hear me. So, when it comes to repairing, we all have at some point a similar experience of something really, really frustrating us, something that we would like it to last longer, but that we can't do much about. And the desire sometimes to actually become, yeah, getting rid of it is always there. But um, as an organization, the Restore Project has two ways to try to change that. And one is like others in this call today, uh, we've been running now for nine years, community repair events that we call restart parties as they're mostly focused on electrical and electronics, but are in the same vein of the repair cafes. And we try to make them fun, interactive, especially pre-pandemic. Right now it's a little bit different and a learning opportunity for everyone, whether you're volunteering or joining as a participant. But we also work to change the system, to bring about the right to repair that will help us uh, just not fix what we can in community events, but fix everything else a lot more conveniently that we can do at the moment. This is a picture from a uh, protest uh, that happened in Brussels earlier this year. We are one of the co-founding members of the European Right to Repair campaign. In this case, asking for regulations to make printers uh, last longer and avoid manufacturers getting away with completely non-ambitious um, voluntary agreements uh, to make products just a little bit more sustainable, but not enough from our perspective. And the reason we do all of this is indeed that there is nothing like extending the life of a product that you already have if you are to make a real impact on the environment. This was the theme of this year's International Repair Day, um, a day and a weekend uh, last week uh, when groups from around the world celebrated the day online, in person, those that could. Uh, I know some people in this call had events. We celebrated with an exhibition in London on the on repair uh, as essential around the world. And the reasons we focused on the environmental side of things, it's not just because of course it's COP26 in a couple of weeks, but there's a lot more. And 
one key message from us is that the greenhouse gas emissions for all the products that we use are mainly happening at production stage. Uh, this is an example of a phone from a few years ago, but the proportions remain the same. The vast majority, up to 80% of the all the greenhouse emissions in a product will have occurred before you've ever switched that product on. So the only thing we can do is extend the consumer phase of that product. So the amount of years and not just months that a product gets used. That's the only way. And so repair and reuse are the most important ways to fix our relationship with the products uh, that we use every day. But of course, there's also the problem of e-waste. Uh, this stat is a little bit more well known. The fact that the UK specifically is the second per capita producer of electronic waste in the whole world. But differently from Norway, from as you see from this uh, stat, uh, we manufacture and we produce a lot more in uh, actual numbers of this waste. So it's really something that needs tackling and extending the lifetime of products will reduce uh, the push to produce more and more e-waste. So our right to repair is under threat. What, what does it mean? It means that uh, more often than not, even people at com community repair events uh, experience that we don't have sufficient access to affordable spare parts. So when you need to replace a part, often it's too expensive or hard to find. Repair manuals and diagnostic tools are not available to everyone. And often we find alternative ones, but it's not the same and we need to spend time and we don't access all the official information the manufacturers should be making available. And not not uniquely important, but crucial, uh, design for repair is not there. Products are not designed to be repaired. It might take too much time or we might risk of breaking a product further in the attempt to reach to the part that needs fixing. Many of you will have heard uh, around July, a big celebration that uh, now in the UK, we have the right to repair our products and uh, Unfortunately, uh, I, I, I hate to have to break the news that this is not the case yet. And that's why we think that a lot more needs to happen to make the right to repair a reality in the UK as well as in, in Europe. Um, as we campaign both in Europe and in the EU and in the UK, we, we know that um, the introduction of a very initial positive uh, regulation that makes some spare parts available for a number of years for white goods and televisions and more repairable designs is a positive announcement, um, but it only ap applies to brand new products that are put on the market now and only gives limited access to people in community repairers or consumers and only a lot more access to spare parts to uh, professional repairers with extra caveats and gray areas that uh, remain big question marks on, on what is the future of this regulation. But it doesn't apply to a vast range of products that people bring to community repair events. And the thing is, We've been collecting data uh, alongside partners from around the world, uh, showing the wide range of products that are brought to these events. And people, it's not like people just want washing machines to be repairable. Everyone who wants repairable product want all of products to be repairable and longer lasting. So we really need to change uh, regulation at a much broader level. And the UK public does want the government to take action on repairable products. Um, the data here is three years old, but it shows really, really overwhelming support. And um, 
subsequent polling uh, that we've recently done and that we are about to uh, make public shows overwhelming support in the UK uh, for additional measures to push uh, right to repair way beyond what's happened so far on white goods. So keep an eye on the Restart Project channels for more communication on that in coming days. Mm. But at UK level, in terms of government, we're still behind when it comes to uh, adopting a similar approach to what the EU is currently discussing. The EU is working already on regulation to make smartphones and tablets and computers more repairable. And there's, there's a, been a strong uh, message coming from in the UK from the House of Commons, the Environmental Audit Committee with a really strong report asking for right to repair to be enshrined in legislation. But we don't know as of yet of any plan of the UK government to adopt similar legislation for additional products. And that's why uh, we've been running a petition asking for a real right to repair in the UK, meaning asking for affordable parts and repair information available to everyone, asking the government to commit to covering a wider range of products, ideally all products, but starting with smartphones and tablets, and remove the VAT on repairs, which would have been a lot more complicated when the UK was part of Europe, but it's possible and would affect positively the repairs done on all the products that we already all have a home. I'll be happy to talk more in the questions on all of this, but thank you for listening and uh, yeah, looking forward to hear your thoughts. Brilliant, thank you, Hugo. I think lots, lots to think about for people. Um, and if you've got, as I say, if you've got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll come back to them in a little while. Um, so next I'm going to hand over to Chris, who is um, dialing in from Belfast this evening um, and it's part of Repair Cafe Belfast. She's going to talk to us a bit about um, more at a community level, um, organising repair events and that kind of thing. So over to you, Chris. Sorry, I've got a couple of errant children who are just leaving. Thank you very much, Claire. And it's really good to be here and to, to see so many people interested in repair. And I'm here to just talk a little bit about um, what's happening in communities up and down the country um, and give you the example of what we're doing in Belfast to repair together and to bring people together to repair. And um, given that start, the funny thing is my first line that I wrote in my notes here is I've got three young children. And so something is always getting broken on a, a daily basis or at least a weekly basis. The knees are coming out of small boys' trousers, kitchen gadgets, push chairs, bikes. And it used to feel kind of overwhelming, really. How have I got time to deal with all of this? And why do these things not last? And what am I going to do now? Um, and I, you can kind of understand why people um, think the easiest thing is just to replace the item and there's not time to repair um, or it, it feels like a, a bit of a hassle. But then I caught, came across the idea of a repair cafe. And the idea is a pop-up community event where people can get help to fix their broken things. And I had so much broken stuff at home that I thought we need to get one of these in Belfast. So I'm just gonna share my screen here if this works. Uh, so this is us at our first event just coming up to four years ago. We had never met. Um, none of us had ever set foot in a community repair event before because there'd never been one in Northern Ireland. It was snowing and it was two weeks before Christmas, hence the tinsel. I was seven months pregnant and we really had no idea what we were doing or how it would go. But it was an absolutely brilliant morning and we were completely hooked. Uh, people brought a camping table, light up shoes, a talking Elmo, we had a tandem bicycle, we had lamps, we had headphones, kettles, toasters, radios, all kinds of things that people use every day which break and which they wanted to get fixed. The Repair Cafe is, Repair Cafe Belfast is one of around 200 community repair groups and projects around the UK. 
And one of the strengths is that they're rooted in their own communities. So they reflect that community and they have a different flavor or they have, a di they have different connections. In Belfast, we have no fixed abode. We move around to different venues around the city. Um, and that's got a lot of benefits for us. It means that we reach lots more people, lots more neighborhoods. Um, it means we get to work with a lot of different partners and hosts. We like to pay attention to the atmosphere we create. So the pop-up cafe is just as much a part of it as the repairs. Um, it makes people feel welcome. Um, it creates a social space to connect. We use big tables, as you can see there in the, in the picture, so people can meet somebody new. Maybe we have a few repair books to browse or some recycled crafts for kids. And it makes the whole thing a fun experience. It's not just another thing on the to-do list that has to get done in terms of getting something fixed. It becomes some a, a, a joyful morning. It's very important to us that the repair cafe is pay as you feel. It means there's no economic barrier to getting something repaired, which is one of people's biggest concerns when something breaks is how much is this going to cost? Would it be better for me to just go and buy a new one? Is that more affordable? But it also creates this sense of community rather than operating as a service. People are very generous and the donations um, cover our running costs. So we didn't need to get any outside funding until we started taking on other projects and doing other bits of work. At the heart of the repair cafe, oh, there's the buns yet. Sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> At the heart of the repair cafe are our volunteers. And something I was really anxious about when I was starting was finding people with the right fixing skills because I am not a terrific fixer. I've learned a lot from hanging around these people. Um, but it's not, it's not my area of expertise. But it turns out they were there all along. But they were in garden sheds and they were at kitchen tables fixing things, maybe fixing things for friends and family or just tinkering themselves. They weren't widely appreciated or seen in our community. And I think that's the case in many communities. But actually by creating a repair project, we created a space for them to come out um, in the open and um, and contribute their skills to the community. And they absolutely get as much out of it as everyone else um, who participates. People like Ricky here. Ricky trained as an apprentice electrical engineer in the Belfast shipyards, the same shipyards that built the Titanic. Um, and he comes along with his, his friend, John, who joined um, as a mechanical apprentice um, in the shipyards. And now they're both retired and they come and they uh, volunteer together and just really enjoy the crack. And this is Francesca. Um, she's a software engineer originally from Italy before making her home in Belfast. Um, and she said, uh, I believe in the power of giving and receiving, and it is a great joy for me to offer my technical skills as a service for other people. I think the Repair Cafe is a great initiative to bring people together and try to be an alternative voice in our consumerist society. And there are other volunteers who are just as important. That's not just having people who can fix things. There's a lot of organizing that goes on. There's a lot of making people feel welcome and lots of, lots of people involved in that. There are lots of different things that we can fix at a repair cafe and each group will, will tackle a, a slightly different a set of things. People have different expertise, but we always ask people to, to write up on a, a poster what they, what they got fixed at our events. And people bring all sorts of things um, for all sorts of motivations. And we find people are often heart sore about the way that we're living and about our throwaway society. And there, there's a visual, visible relief when they come in to the repair cafe and they realize there are other options. There's someone to help. They don't have to do it on their own. It's something practical that, that you can do, that they can do, that we can do today together. It's not abstract. Um, and so it does offer a practical, tangible benefit for people, but it runs deeper than that. Um, and I was thinking back as I was um, preparing for tonight, I was thinking back to our first event and a toaster that was brought along. Um, something many of us have that breaks. Um, but this toaster was brought along. The owner, I think I have a picture of it here. Yeah, the owner had taken it apart and tried to fix it the year before. And they'd not been able to fix it and they had not been able to get it back together. And uh, it had sat, um, because it was a good toaster and they didn't want to get rid of it, it sat for ages. And then suddenly this repair cafe happened and they were like, brilliant, I know exactly what I'm going to take. So he brought along this toaster 
and we fixed him up, connected him with a, with a repairer who worked on it that morning. They'd never met each other. They spent about an hour together tackling this toaster and um, they thought they'd got it working and the, the repairer said, um, if only we had a piece of bread and we could try this out. And um, somebody who was passing from the, the cafe team said, oh, we've got bread in the kitchen because we're going to have, have some soup with the volunteers. Went and got a slice of bread, put the bread in the toaster and you could have cut the tension with a knife. This group of people who had never met each other before were gathered around this toaster and very emotionally involved in whether this bread was gonna to toast or not. Because there's something restorative about repairing um, and there's particularly something about doing it together in community rather than just as a solo experience. And um, the bread did toast and it worked. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it was just kind of, um, it's a story we always come back to and remember because it sort of like um, reminds us about actually what's going on under the surface. It can look like um, just a, a kind of very useful practical thing to get loads of things fixed, but actually it can be a really deeper experience for people that actually sends them home thinking more about their stuff and their relationship with their stuff. And every time I'm sure that that man makes toast, he remembers coming along again at the end of the repair cafe. People have all sorts of reasons for coming. I mentioned that a lot of people feel just generally frustrated at the way we're living. A lot of people want to do their bit to live more sustainably, to think about climate change. Um, but it, it can feel very difficult as an individual to do that and to, to, um, to respond um, in lots of ways. It can feel like a real uphill struggle to live in the way that you feel you want to be. But here's something that we can do together. Um, but people also tell us not just about the environmental benefits, but all kinds of other benefits in terms of coming together, emotional, mental health, um, that it's changed their way of thinking. Um, it's a common experience for people, both visitors and volunteers, to say that they came for the fixing, but they stayed for the community feeling. And one of the things that started happening after we've been going for a year or two is that other communities got in touch and they said, would you come and run a repair cafe in our village or our town or our area? And um, we weren't keen to do that, but we were happy to talk to them about setting up something in their own area. Um, and we started working with four communities outside Belfast that had held events just before the lockdown. But it showed us that this model can work anywhere. Um, there's one of the, the group in the top right hand is in a tiny little village um, down in the countryside. Um, at the bottom there, they're in a community, uh, community cinema in a seaside town here in Northern Ireland. Over on the left, it's a market hall in a, in a, in a kind of big, uh, a bigger town. Um, and in every case, they've found the people that want to fix, and they've also found people who really value the, the project and want to get involved and bring their broken things. So I know that existing repair cafes all over the UK are really happy to share their experience and their learning and help other people get off the ground. Um, and it feels like collectively, it's something practical that we can do to help um, play our part in, in fixing the climate gap. So thanks very much for the opportunity to tell you our story, a little bit of our story. Um, and I hope if you're not part of a repair cafe already, you might find one in your local area, and go along and check it out and see whether you think it might be something that would work where you are. Brilliant, thank you, Chris. And um, I know there's quite a few of us who run repair cafes on this call, but it's brilliant. Every time you hear a story of how another repair cafe runs, you always get ideas. <laughs> there are various things in the chat there about, oh, we're going to do that poster idea. And <laughs> I love it how there's such diversity within uh, repair cafes and restart projects across the country and the world, in fact. And um, it's always great to sort of pick up different ideas. Um, and there's a very interesting little um, connection here as well with toasters so um what we're going to do just before we go on to um the q a um is i'm joined here this evening by um guy from now guy you can come off mute <laughs> i can introduce myself i'm from the uh cambridge repair cafe thank you and we've got canal here as well do you want to come off mute as well canal everyone uh, I'm from Sustainable Dicot, so me and Phil work have worked together on a couple of couple of repair cafes. 
Brilliant. Thank you for joining us this evening. And um, we just wanted to actually hear from some people who had, um, you know, sort of an individual experience of, of repair. And um, so I thought I'd just ask you guys a few questions this evening. And then if people have additional questions, we can sort of come to that towards the end. But um, Canal, maybe I can start with you. And I'm wondering, sort of, you know, if you think back a few years ago, well, Toaster is what uh, made me think when Chris was talking about yeah. that Toaster story. I know you have a slightly different toaster story but you know in the past if something had broken um would it have been your default to you know get the screwdriver out and try and fix it how would you have um that wasn't actually uh the most well uh, that wasn't that wasn't my my go-to path usually but um I'm, I'm the kind of person who go around the charity shop to find rather than buying a new one i'm, I'm the kind of person who kind of try and look for repurposing stuff and uh, one day my wife found Sustainable Decor uh, on, on, on Facebook and I was like, well, that's, that's great. So we joined the page and there was, there was an event coming up called Repair Cafe. I was like, oh, that's interesting, let's have a go. Uh, so we took our toaster, uh, unfortunately it couldn't be repaired, it was beyond, beyond it could. But then we saw that, that the environment and, and, and what the purpose was for that, that particular you know, gathering that these people are just offering free service to bring things back to life. And, you know, uh, I, th I thought that was brilliant, you know, brilliant idea for a uh, brilliant application of the sustainability. Uh, and, and then we, um, we carried on going to these cafes. And recently, just after lockdown, uh, there was an email from Phil, I think, that mentioned that we have a couple of sessions for training yourself to to be able to repair yourself and and even contribute if you, if you would like uh, so these were like basic absolutely basic uh electrical i'm not from electrical background i'm from a software background but i don't i'm the kind of person who would not open a lot of things if i weren't sure that how to put it back so i went to these couple of training sessions and um managed to fix things faster than i was hoping myself to do at those training events. So Phil said, uh, yeah, why don't you come and uh, help us out on repair cafes that we hold here? And I said, well, yeah, I'll definitely give it a try. All I could do is soldering. That, that's, that's, that's my forte now, apparently. Um, but then uh, I think a couple of months ago, there was a repair cafe event. I went there knowing only soldering, whereas there were veterans who had designed, you know, circuit boards for spaceships and stuff like that so i felt a bit more comfortable that you know if i can't solve this there is somebody there is somebody who certainly can uh so i felt very comfortable that way but then my very first thing i i repaired or helped solder was a, a radio control toy car and and it came in it was just sat there and and nobody kind of well it was sitting in the queue and, and that was probably the only thing i could do so i i had a go at it and, and managed to repair it. And the result was a, a kid, you know, wanted to see it working and it was, it was absolutely you know, over the moon about it. So um, that, that's, that, that's the first fruit of that labor, I would say, for me personally being associated with the Repair Cafe, going to these training sessions. And second, uh, as a side effect, I would say, a byproduct was a bit more confidence in myself that okay i can i can tackle this i can open things up worse come I, I can go to one of the repair cafe and then hopefully somebody senior would have a look at it if i can't put it back or make it work so that's the kind of confidence it, it, it kind of gave me and then a month after we had a, another repair cafe and i went in again and this time i graduated from a toy car to a, a place in remote control that was another uh, success story so I think I'm gradually, I feel like I'm gradually growing confidence that hopefully at some point I'll, I'll repair one of the sp spaceships if I can. Brilliant. But, and well, and a great start from a broken toaster to now being, I think, affectionately known as the soldering ninja of, <laughs> of Dead Cuts Repair Cafe as well. So yes. brilliant how you've come on. Um, Guy, can I ask you? So um, I think uh, I heard a rumour that you, um, as a teenager, used to, you know, jump into skips to find things. I try not to jump 
<clears throat> all the okay. way in. <laughs> Uh, but it's true that I can't walk past the skip and not crane my neck. And if I see something good, I can't, I can't leave it behind. The idea that it might just be left and, and go into a landfill when it could be rescued. I mean, <laughs> two doors down from me, I won't pick it up because it's in pieces. Two doors down from me yesterday, I was cycling home. and There was a wheelie bin that the recycling men had refused to take because it had electronics in it that had some sort of broken Bluetooth speaker in it. Well, obviously I had to take it. So I've spent this afternoon just uh, pulling it apart and I've diagnosed that it had a broken volume dial and a uh, blown speaker. So I've opened my drawer of speaker bits from other things I've taken apart and found a suitable thing and I'll get a replacement volume dial on eBay. And there you go. It's a, all right, it's not quite in perfect condition, but it's working and that would have otherwise gone to landfill. And it's things like that that give me the addiction that I, uh, it's terrible. I can't leave it behind. And so it sounds like you've had quite a different experience of kind of coming into the <laughs> community repair network um, from Canal. You know, you've obviously got that history of tinkering and, mm. and, and learning things. So how did you first come across sort of the community repair and, um, you know, your local repair cafe? Yeah, so I, I had sort of had this uh, bug for a long time. And um, when I moved to Cambridge from a much uh, smaller town south of London with no such exciting things happening, um, I, I, don't, I don't, don't exactly know how I came across the concept, um, but I thought, well, that sounds, it must have been on Facebook through like a local group. And I thought, well, that sounds really interesting. I'll go down and see what it's like. And I, I saw it and it just blew my mind uh because all along I had I loved the idea of being able to do it for other people but I'd always been too afraid that there might be some sort of liability issue or something like that um and it just opened my eyes to the fact that actually this is very clearly a possibility um and that the repair cafes have been functioning and doing hundreds of repairs over the years and I haven't, as far as I'm aware, been sued by anybody for a repair that went wrong. Um, and so it just really gave me a lot more confidence to, to start doing it a bit more. And a similar experience to Canal that having the other people around at the repair cafe that had more experience that had been doing it for a longer time um, also reassured me that even if I did get a bit stuck, then I would be able to have somebody to talk to about it. That definitely seems to come across um, in both of your stories, that sort of uh, learning from each other as well um, and and having people to kind of share share the bug with and, and do things. So, yeah, thank you very much, both of you, for joining us this evening. I'm sure as we come to questions, there might be some uh, more things that would be really great to hear your sort of uh, volunteering perspective from. So thank you. Um, now we let me have a quick look in our chat and things um, if anyone's thought of any questions we'll have a look through the chat and the ones that we've got there but equally you know if you um want to use the, the hand up feature or anything like that um let's see so um what i might start with is just going back to um some of the questions maybe for you ugo um around the right to repair if we maybe go back to that um Oh, there's an initial question, I think, from one of your graphs about what, what are they doing in Norway to create so much e-waste? Although maybe it'd be interesting to also know who had the least e-waste and therefore what they were doing well, but what's Norway doing? Norway, well, I think uh, definitely there is, it's a quite wealthy country per capita. And uh, so there is certainly like a lot of consumption of, electronic devices, uh, probably more so per capita on average than, than here. Um, interestingly, Norway for such products actually has um, quite useful um, warranties, uh, longer term warranties for products such as smartphones and the likes up to five years, but that doesn't seem by itself to reduce the amount of e-waste that they generate. So um, they have some interesting model there for a longer time warranty. So if you have a faulty product, even if it's four and a half years old, uh, if it's of a certain value, you can go and get it uh, 
replaced or in some cases getting repaired, um, which is much better if, it, if we can require it to be repaired. But I don't know what exactly they do, but certainly it's a fairly affluent society and uh, probably that fuels extra consumption of products. Can I make a comment on that? One of the things I noticed about that uh, table was that a lot of the countries that are at the top are quite high income countries. And I think this is one of the challenges that we have as repairers that, or well, not for us as repair cafes, because of course we're working for free, but if people's idea is, well, I need to find a repair business, a shop that can repair this for me. If your uh, average country wage for skilled labor is 50 or 60 or a hundred pounds an hour, then you're going to very much struggle to compete when you're choosing against something where you buy the factory and then the marginal cost of producing additional units is almost nothing. Um, so in a country like Norway, it, it kind of makes sense that people would maybe be much more reluctant to pay for a repair because the, the chance of that repair failing is non-zero and they're going to have to pay a significant amount for somebody's skilled labor. It, that that's certainly an issue like the cost of uh, uh, labor for 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 repairs absolutely but it, and obviously we want repairs to be pay, paid fairly mm. so how do we reduce the cost of repairs in in other ways and one yeah, is by making the repair easier so that it might take less time and so that they can make more money by repairing more things rather than <laughs> charging potentially a lot. And also uh, reducing taxation on repair by uh, VAT, for example, as well as reducing the cost of spare parts, which currently could be a burden um, mm -hmm. when they're not reused parts like you have for speakers. So, uh, of course, there is a multiple a set of ways, but you're absolutely right. I lived for a few years in, in Kenya, where I took a lot of inspiration for, for some of the work we're doing today. And uh, over there, I, I still remember one time having a, a headphone set bought in the UK that uh, just to have a look at it, one faulted the manufacturer wanted 45 pounds. And uh, I got it repaired in 15 minutes at the repair shop in Kenya for three pounds. So while also being learning the skills that I would have to repair it myself the following time. So yes, of course, there is an issue there. Uh, mm. But also some products have become just simply too cheap because the yes. environmental impact of this product is not factored in in the price of brand new products. And uh, yeah, so we need to really change the system basically. This makes me think as well when you were saying about your experience in Kenya one of the things obviously for some of the sort of repair cafe and restart projects is really helping people to learn as well how to do it themselves next time and it's brilliant when you get someone that then you know sends you a message going well this time I've managed to <laughs> I've managed to fix it which is equally brilliant um so another question before we move on maybe to um some of the actual more sort of uh, community repair questions um Ugo again was for you was just um around how is the restart project able to make an impact in brussels from obviously now being outside of the uk yes that's an excellent question and uh, we don't do this uh, alone um, we co-funded uh, the european right to repair campaign which by the way it's european meaning it concerns all countries in the geographic sense of europe which could include norway switzerland and the uk as well as the eu countries and um, it has members already in 17 countries uh, it's a coalition of over 80 organizations uh, some of them are based in brussels and restart uh, employs a campaigner who is based in um, Brussels and helps coordinate messaging and bringing together a mix of the policy demands that some of our more policy minded members uh, come up with, with campaigning and messaging to help raise awareness. So we're certainly not doing that alone. And I agree that 
it would not be best for an organization based in the UK to tell the EU what needs to be done, but in collaboration, definitely. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, Chris, maybe you could take some of the um, repair cafe, sort of more community repair cafe questions. So um, one of them we've got is, you know, how do the groups work practically? So, um, you know, are we registered charities, businesses, bank accounts, insurance, all those kind of things? Um, well, as I mentioned, well, there, are, there are 200 groups and they operate in different ways. Um, there's no one size fits all. And actually, most of the groups have come up from the grassroots um, and organized independently. And the community repair network that Claire mentioned at the beginning of the talk is, is an effort to actually um, bring us closer together and encourage dialogue so that we can kind of share those experiences. So for us in Belfast, we're a community interest company, um, but we operated as an unincorporated community group before we, we um, registered and founded that. Others operate as charities. Some are organized into um, groups of repair cafes, which have a, offer an umbrella structure. Um, some repair cafes are projects of other community groups that do a number of different initiatives and running a repair cafe is just one of them. So there are lots of different models. And I think it kind of really reflects the local circumstances and how the group came into being, what structure they have. Um, does that answer everything, Claire? Was there something else in that question? Um, yeah, I think as well, I suppose other than um, the question that always gets asked most is about things like health and safety policies and insurance. That would probably be something in that as well. Yes, and it has been a challenge, I think, for many groups to, um, to kind of make it clear what they do to insurers in order for insurers to have a, a clear understanding about what the, the risks are. Um, and, but the, some groups operate without insurance. Um, and have kind of organized themselves to do that. Um, I know certainly here in Ireland, there were a lot of groups that found it hard to get insurance. And so I did bike and textile repairs and stayed away from electronics. That was how they managed that risk. Um, so, I mean, certainly it is possible now, there are a number of insurers that do understand the concept because the groups have been more, um, more uh, common. I think um, there's been more dialogue with different insurers. Um, so there's a number of different products available that provide um, public liability insurance, um, liability that would cover your volunteers um, from accident. But I think it, it's actually, while it's easy to um, think about risk in terms of um, all the things that could go terribly wrong, I think it's actually not a high risk activity, um, especially if you um, have your have a, a good kind of health and safety policy that, that kind of um, keeps you keeps you right and, and, and ensures that um, like Guy and Kinal touched on it there you know that people who are who are offering to volunteer are operating within their their skill um, and comfort zone um, and that they're not um, taking on repairs that they don't know how to do and so there's a lot about um, Kind of building up a really responsible ethos and, and kind of a sense that health and safety is a shared responsibility um, and our experience is that there have been no accidents and no issues um, and that actually people feel our volunteers feel terribly um, responsible to those they're helping that they want to make sure they're in a better situation when they leave um, and certainly we've had cases where people have brought items for repair and actually been told and advised that um, that item can't be made safe and they should not, they should cut the plug off and dispose of it. And actually they are safer because they came to a repair cafe and got that advice than if they had um, carried on using it. So I think, it, it, of course, it is a concern. It's something that experienced repair cafes are more than happy to discuss with people who are, are getting involved in this and who are, have a lot of questions about it. Of course, it's an issue people are concerned about, but I think it's about keeping it in proportion and, um, and being wise um, but not letting the fear of the worst case scenario stop you doing something which is very practical and beneficial. 
I know that's really good and also it's interesting um as someone who helps other people set up repair cafes um it's quite interesting depending on uh, where people are coming from so I'll often be approached by someone who's maybe part of a parish council and obviously they're thinking around risk and all those kind of things can be quite different who, from you know someone who's linked with a men's shed and wants to expand that and just loves fixing and so you know it's all about finding that sort of sensible ground and, and meeting the people with that. The model of the repair cafe is neighbours helping neighbours. Mm. And if you think about that and you organise your events to reflect that, and that's why, you know, I spoke there about how important the community side of things is for us, because that's, it's, it is important because it feels really, really good. But it also has a lot of benefits in terms of managing risk because people are very concerned to help their neighbours and not do anything that might harm them but equally those neighbours are then very grateful for the help and the support that they have received so if you if you think of it with that mindset it kind of makes it feel more manageable and, and helps you to navigate those issues. That's great and actually that maybe uh, moves on to one of the questions which um, someone's asking saying do people pay for spare parts do people sometimes need to come back for a couple of ca uh, you know, cafe sessions to get something mended I'm just thinking what we're talking about sort of paying for things as well maybe comes into that certainly well i think most repair cafes would operate on a pay as you feel basis as we would some would be um a little clearer about you know these are the parts in belfast we tend to send people away to get their own spare parts because we don't have any premises and we don't we wouldn't be in a position to keep a stock of spare parts for every pot potential thing that could go wrong we have a small fix it box which has some useful things in it but we couldn't possibly have everything um so sometimes people do go away and um they get a diagnosis but they can't get um a kind of surgery at their first visit and they do need to kind of but we do say, you know, if you go away, you can get this part. This is what you're looking for. Here's where you might be able to get it. If you can't work out, you know, bring it back to the repair cafe next time and we'll be able to fit that for you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, people, I again, people tend to be very generous and they're very keen to support the project. And when they're in a position to um, people don't want um, don't don't want the project to be out of pocket for having got got parts for them or or materials um, to carry out the repair. So, yeah, it, the, the, the kind of, again, the kind of analogy that's really helpful is that thinking, thinking about a community repair group is like a first aid clinic for your stuff. And sometimes it can't be fixed. Um, sometimes you need to go to the hospital because you need more um, time, specialist tools um, or, or parts or, or special training that are not available, especially in light of what Hugo says in terms of how difficult things are sometimes made to be repaired. Um, so we wouldn't hope to um, fit, uh, fix everything that comes, but at least if we can provide people with some advice, with um, a diagnosis, that's still a really useful um, starting point and they know what to do next. Or even to say this item isn't going to be repairable, at least people can let go of it and they feel like um, you know, they can move on. I'm just thinking as well, I'm guessing like Canal, for example, when you're doing soldering, you come with your soldering kit, I'm guessing, and some solder and you don't, you know, there's a basic amount of stuff you have with you? Uh, no, I don't actually. I borrow, uh -huh. uh, I, there are lots of senior people who come with that kit. Uh, there's a gentleman, Chris, Chris Elsie, um, he, he has, has got his kit. So usually he's, he's fixing maybe other things. So the soldering iron is not always in his eyes, just apply my skills using that and uh yeah brilliant and that's another example actually because lots of people bring their stuff and but if you haven't yeah. got something for the job there's always like hang on a sec who's got sort of exactly. sharing things exactly yeah mm. maybe no, just to some. say a, a different perspective on how else it could be done in cambridge we're very fortunate that a local diy store um has uh, offers to store uh, a, a collection of tools and small consumable parts so like fuses resistors capacitors like just bits and bobs that are very commonly involved in a repair um, and then we've had a donation of tools from um, is it Dr Draper yeah yeah um, Draper have donated like uh, tools to go in that toolkit which is then stored at uh, Mackay's DIY store and so for each time that we run a repair cafe um, or in the local area the repair cafe is asked to contribute 20 pounds towards the like consumables and bits and bobs and maintenance in the kit and it means that pretty much anything 
is going to be in that toolkit. I have lots of my own tools, which I obviously love and prefer to use my own. But if I am, as I very often am, cycling to the repair cafe, then I can quite happily choose to just shove in an adjustable screwdriver um, and a multi-tool. And I know that everything else will be there. And likewise, anybody can turn up who's got any level of tool ownership. And so long as they've got the skills to use a spanner or pliers or a soldering iron then there's going to be the equipment that they need to to do things and there's things in there that i don't have like we have a variable hot air gun which is incredibly useful i know most people don't have a variable voltage supply which again is insanely useful when you're doing an electronic repair um so that's uh, if it's an option for people i'd encourage it because it works really really well for us Brilliant. There is there is such diversity. And remember as well that it's not always just electricals and computers and things that we're fixing. So sometimes it's a needle and thread. <laughs> and, um, definitely fit them in your bag on your bike or whatever it might be. But yeah, there's a great breadth of stuff that's repaired. Um, One of the ladies who does textiles, uh, I, I'm pretty sure Gina comes to every repair cafe that we do. Um, she comes with a bike trailer and brings a sewing machine. And uh, yeah, so there's no reason a bike needs to be a barrier to bring lots of equipment. You should see my bike trailer. <laughs> you know, mm. it's, it's, it's good exercise. I'm really glad Portsmouth is flat. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, um, just uh, let's take a slightly different question. We've got for Ugo here. Um, the Restart Project offers a 10 week course for school children. Um, does anyone know if any organizations are interested in doing something similar for adults? Ugo, I just wondered if you were aware of anything. Yeah. Like, um, so uh, just to clarify that project was an experiment and at the moment we just share what we've done with it we're not actively um, pursuing this activity in other schools we don't have the capacity to do that at the moment but it's also out there for others to uh, to learn from and see what might be reusable by them in other uh, circumstances but um, it's interesting what, what you're uh, what this question is interesting because just this afternoon I, I was uh, uh, in a different uh, online call uh, discussing the links between the the culture of repair emerging from community activities and the need for the right to repair and whether this should be inspiring um, people that are doing engineering and product design work at, at universities or people that are already uh, in these professions. I know the question was specific, more about courses for adults in general, but there's clearly some really transferable skills that can inspire a rethink of how we look at products and, and not just how we fix them in a way. Um, in addition to that, I think in in London, we've seen um, some spaces uh, that run courses in a way inspired by this type of DIY approach and helping you learn basic electricals or other uh, more hands-on um, skills for other types of making. Um, but I'm not aware of classes specifically to teach repair, like in a formalized way. If others do, That'd be great to hear. Yeah, well, I was going to say, Phil, um, I'm wondering if you've got anything to add on the basis of you um, got Kunal onto a course. I'm just wondering how did that come about? Is that something that's ongoing? Or? Yeah, so this is something, so sustainability part, is part of the Community Action Group Network in Oxfordshire, which is a, a, quite a large group. I think they've almost reached 100 separate groups. Some of those are kind of... Um, uh, work around co-ops and things like that but a lot of them are groups small community groups like sustainable dig Park, and they put on these training sessions for electricals and um, it was it was very much an introduction to um electrical items and so, sort of rewiring the plug having to go with um kind of wire strippers and things like that uh, and then it moved on to having to go with soldering and so they had um soldering kits that you uh were pre pre-made that you just put the components on and then tested solder and like, had to go at soldering them onto the board. Um, so that's where they're at, at the moment. They weren't, uh, they, we haven't got any courses to say kind of, now here's how to actually diagnose and treat a, this is more, this is at the moment that they're getting through experience. So 
perhaps like Canal, he comes and joins an experience uh, repairer, and then they get kind of experience that way. Um, so that's where how it's running at the moment. I don't know if there's anyone else that's on the call who's got any um, experience of that, but if you have, feel free to. Just to say that some, some repair cafes do run um, skills courses, skills shares. I know the group in Bath run a series of how-to workshops, like how to do bike maintenance, how to use a sewing machine, how to do, we've just done visible darning this week. Um, no, don't know if any on electricals, um, but I also, just to reinforce the idea of bringing something to a repair cafe, it's not like going to the phone shop and leaving it off at the counter and coming back and picking it up later. You, you as a visitor are part of the experience and you get to um, be as involved as you want to be in um, participating in the repair and seeing what's inside your, your gadget and in you know, um, watching the repairer or, or taking part as they go step by step through the process. So there's a lot to be learned there. It's not a course, but you know, it, it is an education in, in that wider way. And I know there's also a group in... Um, in based in Edinburgh called the Remade Network that are looking at setting up a repair academy where people would be trained in repair skills with the view of, of kind of setting up, I guess, a development of a repair kind of um, project that's more of a business that would be on high streets and that people would have those kind of repair skills for repairing um, gadgets. Because, you know, 50 years ago, there was a repair shop in every high street where you could take your kettle where it broke or your toaster. And they have just mostly all gone um, and you know if we are going to live in a more sustainable way we need to get back to that and we need to work out where the skills are going to come from to do that. Yeah there's an interesting session that was part of this afternoon as part of Ethical Consumer Week which is about the future of the high street and on that they had people um, such as you know Library of Things and different groups saying you know it'd be great to get much more about repair and uh, borrowing and sharing on our high streets although and also a very interesting dilemma of, of the challenge of who owns all those buildings and how hard it is to sort of get into the high street but really interesting discussion and um, Nicole from Cambridge Repair Cafe did you have something to add in? Yeah hello everyone um, yeah so we run a couple of introduction to electrical repairs um so sort of quite targeted towards women actually because we want to get women along to sort of feel more confident to try things at home so we um got I think eight broken lamps and we got people to try and fix them. And so everyone, you worked in pairs and you kind of worked through the whole diagnostic and the process of trying to work out what's going on. And, and there was obviously a, an experienced supervisor. So, and, and that's the evening was a couple of hours with a broken lamp and trying to bring it back to life and introducing you, yeah, to stripping back and soldering and the diagnostic stuff. Yeah, it worked quite well. Brilliant, I like that idea. Yeah. <laughs> and Ugo was just mentioning as well, he'd forgotten to say, um, yeah, you guys do skill share sessions, but amongst the volunteers sort of, spreading the skills yeah in a sense trying to help maybe newcomers gain extra skills and uh, reduce some of their own yeah increase their confidence level and also it's nice because during the repair events it's normally quite hectic you're just trying to help people as as many people as possible and so there isn't as much time for a more relaxed uh just learn from a fellow volunteer experience but we've not really done these um during the pandemic uh, as online sessions to yeah avoid uh, people being too stressed by all this online sessions but we hopefully be able to resume them uh soon in person as they're kind of social opportunities for people to just get together and have some snacks and have a chat while learning something new and that fits perfectly into the next question that I was going to suggest we uh, tackle, which is the question of how soon did various repair cafes represented here return to business after the various lockdowns? Um, so, um, if you'd like to go, Chris, do you want to let yeah, that work to well first? By local situation, I know some repair cafes started up again last autumn in between the lockdowns and operators. Um, and others haven't come back yet. And many, I think, are in the process of exploring it and, and making changes to the way that they operate. So I know for ourselves and I know for, for Claire and Portsmouth, we have started using a booking system, which we didn't use before, so that we know um, how many people to expect and we don't have too many people coming to our events and, and have crowding that way. So there are different ways of working. I know the Repair Cafe in Glasgow has operated outdoors um, for the last several months. Um, 
I don't know what they're going to do in the Scottish winter now. Um, but I think I think it's a very creative community and people are keen to get back and keen to um, find creative ways to do that and, and durable ways that are going to last whatever the ups and downs of the coming months may be. Um, but I think also for ourselves, we were very careful not to move ahead of where um, our volunteers were comfortable. Um, we had a lot of people who had been shielding and we didn't want to leave people behind. We didn't want people to feel under pressure to come back. So we have gone very slowly and gradually. Um, we did two trial run events within our team before we did anything with the public so that we were sure of ourselves, sure of our systems, sure of what worked and what we didn't, you know, what just was a faff and we didn't really need to bother with. Um, and so, yeah, we had our first public public event on Saturday and we didn't even publicize it very much. So it wasn't even properly back. So I, I suspect it'll be the new year before we're properly back in action. Yeah, just saying, Portsmouth, we've been back since July, but with sort of quite a lot of measures in place. So, you know, um, open doors, open windows, masks, um, booking system and um, but it continued, you know, word is getting out that we're back and it's great. And we are keeping those measures in place so that because we want to be able to sort of ride whatever storm and certainly, you know, COVID is increasing down here at the minute. So, um, but we're hopeful that keeping that in place, you know, we can keep everyone safe, but keep, keep fixing. Some groups did continue to operate through lockdown with, with drop-off services as well. I know the Repair Cafe in Mulvern Hills fixed something, was it 400 items or something? Um, throughout lockdown and they had a they had a pick up and drop off service instead of having repair events now obviously you miss out on the whole um experience of being together and doing it together and being able to share knowledge um and it's a lot less fun but it allowed them to help people who maybe were reliant on certain household appliances um and who were shielding and who didn't want to leave their homes they were able to help them so that was really valuable and a lot of groups also moved online and, and, and tried different ways of, of connecting and encouraging repair. Us in Belfast, we did a, a fortnightly mending pile meetup um, throughout the winter where people brought their mending pile that never got attended to. And there was a little opportunity to kind of socially get together and, and all stitch and get some advice about how to tackle different um, textile repairs. So... Yeah, and I think one of the other benefits that Malvin said we're talking about was actually for some of their repairers, it was a real lifeline for them during the lockdowns as well of something to actually do. So the sort of mental health, not just for those people that are getting stuff fixed, but actually for some of the repairers that, you know, it was something to do. Plus, apparently their repair rate increased greatly because obviously they had a huge amount of time to sit tinkering <laughs> and doing things. So um, I think their repair uh, yeah, the repair productivity went through the roof. So, um, yeah. Um, and all that, maybe talk about time. Um, we've got a question here about some of the repairs, like pieces of furniture, broken things that need gluing. Um, they're saying some of that is a skilled job, just even trying to find the right glue. But um, I guess, you know, how do repair cafes face those things? I jump in again. I think experience is the key there. Um, certainly, we have seven or eight different kinds of glue in our fix it box. Um, but it's our experienced uh, repairers who have repaired things in the past and therefore know what, um, what will work, what will be the best kind and who have a good steady hand. And there was a lovely story on Saturday there at a repair cafe, someone who brought a piece of furniture, um, sort of like a, a very, like an antique footstool and the, the, um, the legs had worn, the, where the legs twisted into the footstool had worn away and so they could no longer be attached. And a couple of the fixers got together and they were brainstorming different potential ways to repair it. And in the end, they didn't have the right tool for the job, but they made a little video clip with um, describing how to go about the repair so that the person was able, they knew the person who had brought it knew somebody who would be able to actually fix it locally, but to kind of describe how the repair could happen step by step and what they would do if only they had had the right tools with them. So that was a real team effort. Um, Guy, you wanted to jump in there with? Yeah, Guy, what were you going to say? Um, yeah, the. No, I forgot what I was going to say on that. <laughs> we were talking about glues or different types of glues. Yeah, I mean, it was, <laughs> I, I think it was basically to mirror Chris's point to say that experience really helps. Um, and when you've got this toolkit that's got all different kinds of glue in there, um, you can have a go with a little patch on an out of the way point and and see if the first one that takes 
you, my first resort is usually super glue because they're super strong and it sets really quickly. But if you find that that's not sticking, then you can move on to, to something else. Um, but yeah, I think experience makes all the difference here. I have to say I've got very knowledgeable about glue as well in the last four years. I never knew there was such a variety of epoxy resins and sugru and all these kind of things. And the other, my other top tip was, uh, especially when we had sort of china repairs, having my daughter along was really helpful because, you know, smaller fingers can fix ah. things that the biggest fingers can't do. And that's the thing that I really love is trying to encourage kids to get involved in this. Um, we haven't managed it quite so much um, since COVID, but um, it was brilliant. We used to have, you know, uh, kid volunteers. So parents would bring their children along to volunteer with them and really part of the activity. And, you know, whether it was... Um, welcoming people or helping to fix stuff the kids really learned and got involved so much so that my daughter's about to turn 13 now but um you know she's sort of the go-to at school of like this is broken what do you think we should do just wow i mean that's the future we need isn't well it? done you know that, that's the thing i think about repair cafes or repair projects is they're creating that space where the focus is on repair and so actually suddenly you can pull your knowledge you can explore options you can um you can go away and research like the, the internet is a fantastic resource and suddenly people are thinking about repair it's, it becomes your first instinct instead when something breaks you think i must replace that you suddenly your first instinct is i wonder who can fix that i wonder how i can go about fixing that i wonder where i can get the knowledge or the advice or the professional who could help me and like in repair cafe belfast we've looked at something like 1200 items since we started so there is a bank of knowledge within our team now about what's going to work what's going to be useful what kinds of things people bring um you see some of the same things over and over again we have a balloon in our fix it box um an empty balloon and it's because one time it was re someone was fixing um a really precious china cup that had been given to somebody and they were trying to glue it together but by in inflating this balloon slightly they were able to get just to hold the cup while they glued it and get the purchase on it so we never would have thought of that in advance you know what do we need in our to-do list but now having seen that happen it's there in case we ever need it again um, so it's that collective knowledge um, which is about like we have 50 volunteers about them all coming together and about having that shared experience and just creating that focus on repairing our stuff it raises the profile it changes our way of thinking about it um, yeah Brilliant. Love it. We've got the end of like a wax candle in our packet and that's for zips and things like that. You know, it's these tiny little odd things. You're like, why is that in there? But even this week we use it on this week. You know. um, now I'm going to pre, um, pre warn this question for those of you that I know love to answer questions about fixing things. We have got a question uh, about repair. This does not mean that you've now got five minutes to diagnose into it. So in a really quick answer anyone can answer but uh, rose is asking her amplifier won't switch off is it a simple repair who's got an opinion it's an, a difficult diagnosis and a potentially simple repair that was nice and short and sweet guys definitely find your closest repair cafe rose I think yeah, thing. definitely wor definitely worth trying 100 percent I'm so impressed, Guy. That was really good. Normally, if I'm I biting ask, my tongue. <laughs> if I, I know, I know. Well done. <laughs> it's hilarious. It could have been that. a very, very elaborate answer. <laughs> exactly, Hugo. That's totally what I was expecting. That's why I've got ten questions that I want to ask Rose, <laughs> and I just uh, I'm really holding them in, and it's not easy. We can have a separate chat on that anyway. Um, and um, this kind of leads on to that question. I think this was probably just because at the start I said something about uh, switching my Fairphone off. Uh, but someone was asking, why is the take up of Fairphone being so low in the UK? Uh, this hasn't been an issue in Germany. So I was just thinking in the sense of that question, obviously, for those of you that don't know, a Fairphone um, is sort of seen as a very repairable thing. It's very modular. So the, the whole sort of beauty of it is that you can repair it a lot more simply. So I, Hugo, I don't know if you have any um, inside knowledge. What's why, why are we a bit behind on that sort of lovely repairable? Well, okay, um, so uh, one, one thing to keep in mind and uh, that just in terms of the size of markets, uh, it's important. Well, Obviously, Fairphone is doing a fantastic job of creating awareness about how it's possible to make repairable products. In terms of commercial success, 
it is limited, like across the whole of Europe. Uh, they've sold a few hundred thousand devices <clears throat> over the, the years. So every year in Europe, there are over 200 million uh, smartphones um, sold. So it's it's they are extremely popular across the type of people that will go to repair cafes and uh, that are very environmentally conscious. But in terms of numbers, they've sold uh, and they've influenced the market at a very small level. Like they've made it the case for products to be repairable. And that's the most important aspect of their work in a sense, more so than the product itself. Um, so I think this is important just to see like how, why is it that we want the right to repair in legislation? Because we want every <laughs> phone to be re as repairable as a fair phone, not just the zero point something percent of the phones that are bought uh, every year. And, and I'll just plug in there, I'll put a link later, uh, the European wide campaign that we have ongoing with right to repair at the moment, which is that for a phone that will last 10 years uh, and you'll find uh, a letter and a funny fake product launch <laughs> uh, link to this, which is uh, well, I'll share the link on the on the chat, uh, but I think that one of the reasons that Fairphone has sold more in Germany compared to the UK is that in Germany, they've had um, a partnership with one of the mobile operators, which has made them visible in a lot more shops compared to the UK, where they only had a connection with the uh, phone corp, which has some visibility online, but doesn't really appear in that many stores. Um, and also Germany, uh, historically, people are very much uh, more privacy focused and uh, Fairphone did come up with a version that wouldn't run the full um, Google version of Android, which means a version without a lot of the data tracking, which is linked to using your phone with a Google account. So that appealed to people in Germany, possibly more than in the UK. Thank you, Uwe. Now, um, I'm conscious of time. I think we've pretty much got through all the questions that are on there. Um, and I know someone's just asked for a, a list of the toolkit. There's a couple of things in, uh, a couple of suggestions from people and some links uh, about that. Um, so I thought maybe just to finish off, um, I would just share, let's see if I can do this share my screen with just some of the sort of things that we'd sort of suggest um can i oh, no don't go that far just some of the things the sort of calls to action the suggestions that we've um covered off today um and they're sort of different activities based i suppose depends dependent on where where you are tonight and how you've you've joined us so the first thing is you know if you're an individual one of the things that we'd really like you to do which Ugo mentioned is um, help us call on government and policymakers with this right to repair now all these things that we talked about are sort of actions and things that you can get involved with we will send out an email um, next week with a link to um, this recording as well so that you can uh, share it with people or listen to elements of it again and also it will include these sort of uh, links as well so don't worry about having to jot them down now but um, there's certainly you know this is the the petition and I'll also include that link that Ugo's just mentioned about the um, 10 year phone uh, the other thing is if you're an individual you know support your local repair cafe so if you need something fixed um, there are a couple of places you can look there's the repair cafe foundation website and there's also the restart projects and between them they cover a lot of the repair cafes and restart projects that already exist in the uk so you can find somewhere and check obviously if they're open at the minute and what their current um, way of working is so get along and take your broken things along to them um, if you are already involved in a repair cafe, one thing that we'd really love everyone to consider if you don't already is um, 
collecting data because all the data that we collect really helps in the arguments and the discussions that people like Ugo are involved with with policymakers. So the data that actually says, you know, what things we fix, what things we haven't fixed, and without the things that we we don't fix, you know, is it uh, because we're lacking in spare parts? Is it that you just can't even get into the blasted thing? Um, and then that really helps when talking with companies as well who say, oh, you know, these things never go wrong and actually we can look at that. And there are two different places that you could potentially put that data within Repair Monitor that's part of the Repair Cafe Foundation or within the Fixometer that Restart, um, Restart Project does. And just to say, both those places lead to the same place. So you don't have to enter in both. Um, so pick one if you um, collect data. Um, what else I can say? If, let me find my notes. Um, before I move into this one as well, if you are part of a repair group, the other thing is that you could um, sign the Manchester Declaration, which is a, a declaration really asking our policymakers and government to change things. And it's really great if you can get your MPs to also sign up to that. And that just, again, kind of increases the, the weight that we've got behind this campaign. Um, if you're also part of a repair group and you'd like to connect and sort of go that bit further, we've mentioned tonight that we're part of the Community Repair Network, and that is a really new thing. Um, we've just sort of come together, and this is the new website that uh, launched, I think it was only last week or so, the Community Repair Network.org.uk. And you can look on that, and we will, we're planning to have an event in the next month or so where people um, can come and hear a bit about what we've been doing so far and um, see if they'd like to get involved. And there's really, if you want to get involved in sort of doing more, so it's not about just um, setting up repair cafes and community repair um, places it's about how as a together as a voice we can make more of a difference but it, it's what I'd say is if you'd like to be um, find out more about that if you want to just drop me an email that I'll make sure that when we have that planned I will let you know and the other thing is if you're interested in setting up a repair cafe the best advice I can give you is to uh, get along find your nearest existing one if you're thinking of setting one up find out what the ones are that are in your county or neighboring counties and get in touch with them because we're all really really happy to be you know sharing sharing the love of this so um you can look on this website to see sort of who's currently involved in that network to get an idea of who it might be but equally look on um the places i've already mentioned where you can find existing repair cafes and um get along and they'll they'll share we're really good at all sharing you know what we've done and experience and you can kind of pick what's right for your um community and um there'll always be there'll always be questions that we can't answer but between us um you know can help and we'll be able to uh, hopefully get you on your way um i think that's pretty much it other than say thank you so much for joining us on this friday evening um if we could all be in a lovely room or you know sharing a drink at the end of this it would be joyous <laughs> but it's been great to see you from so many different parts of the country we really hope it's been useful and um thank you to all of uh you guys who have been part of the panel and speaking as well this evening and um as i say we will drop an email out to everyone next week so um if you've got any questions feel free to contact us via email as well and we'll be able to help. And we are officially the last event of Ethical Consumer Week. So we should sign off on their behalf as well. Uh, feel free to unmute, say bye. But otherwise, um, that's us for this evening. Thank you very much.